Hello, my name is Lino Gudjansson and I'm the Control General for Iceland in New York and Trade Commissioner for Iceland in North America. Uh, we cover both the US and Canada. I am sitting here in one of our favorite spots in our home, a place of relaxation and inspiration. Design is everywhere. As stated by Plinian Atlason, it's about life, it's about how beautiful life can be and it increases the beauty of our life to have both beautiful design but also functional design. It enriches your life and makes it easier. The design scene in Iceland is rapidly growing with a strong focus on sustainability, wellness, nature and community in everything from architecture to graphic design, product design to fashion design, digital design to jewelry design. Many of the designers, they uh, seek inspiration from Icelandic nature. In general, Iceland's focus on, on sustainability, cleanliness, is really reflected in, in many of the designers' work. I think Iceland has a very unique voice when it comes to uh, being a part of the international scene. The Design Diplomacy events were first held in Reykjavik uh, during Design March in 2017. The five-day festival focuses on design as a driving force for innovation and demonstrates the important role of design, architecture and innovation in society. Design Diplomacy is a series of conversation events that take place in diplomatic residencies all around the world. Two designers get together and have this deck of cards in which playful yet intelligent questions challenge the players as well as the audience to consider design as a form of intercultural exchange. How it works is that we build international links for diplomatic representations, design professionals, as well as audiences. The Design Diplomacy was created by Helsinki Design Week. That was five years ago, and ever since then, we've played Design Diplomacy card games in over 20 residencies around Helsinki every year in September. Additionally, these conversation events have taken place in Reykjavik, Tokyo, in New York, in uh, Madrid, Oslo, Berlin, as well as Canberra. We at Helsinki Design Week and in Weekly, we believe in international cooperation and in the possibility to change the world through meaningful encounters and interactions. Sometimes all you need is a deck of cards. Incidentally, the word diploma derives from a Greek word that means a paper folded in two. Hello, my name is Linnur Gudjonsson and I'm the Consul General and Trade Commissioner for Iceland in North America. My wife Lulu and I welcome you to our home, where we live with our two senior pugs, Mars and Safi, at the beautiful Maurice on 58th Street in Manhattan. The Maurice was built in a Grand Pre-War construction style in 1924 and has been owned by the same family since 1930. Built with a Georgian influence, it was originally designed for international travels during the post-World War I boom in the U U.S. during the go-go years. It has been home to Hollywood stars including Faye Dunaway, Frank Langella and Kathleen Turner. And every day I enjoy uh, the 200-year-old Friends White Pine paneled original lobby. Design Diplomacy is a series of discussion events held in Consul General's residencies. A design professional from the hosting country meets a local designer in a card game in which playful and intelligent questions challenge both the speakers and the audience to reflect upon design as a part of inter inter intercultural exchange. The design diplomacy events were first held in Reykjavik during the Design March Festival in 2017 in collaboration with Helsinki Design Week. In the concept owner. It is my pleasure to introduce the two designers in this conversation today. Atlason is a design studio um, based in New York City since 2004, focusing on products and goods 
that are both beautiful and hold up in environmental scrutiny. Inspired by William McDonough's uh, Cradle to Cradle, which confronted the hidden costs of cheap design, Atlason puts sustainability at the center of its design practices. Linner's fully functional process uh, pro produces furniture, consumers, products, and packaging that live at the nexus of world-class design and sustainability. Today, Atlason continues to push the boundaries of technology and design to make the world more beautiful and a livable place, one product at a time. Todd Bracker is a designer and a strategist known for his irreductibly complex approach to, to design. His studio guides some of the world's leading brands to realize strategic different differentiations through design, including 3M, Burberry, and Jaguar. And he has served as a creative director for George Jensen, uh, Human Scale, and HBF. Todd has been honored as a top 100 global design influencers by Wallpaper Magazine and International Designer of the Year. I'm going to start with a hard one. OK. Ooh. What do you wish you had designed yourself? I'm assuming that means uh, mm. I wish that I had designed the wheel. I think that would have been <laughs> amazing. Yes. You know, I would, I would want to take credit for that. That's fair. Uh, so in design history, I can't really say that there is one design uh, that I'm selfish enough to want to have taken credit for. Fair enough. Cool. How about yourself? Oof. I think um, I'm a little bit different. I, um, I think for myself, I really get that thought. Maybe probably some type of um, like a monument or something that's really like honoring. Um, I think that's something that's very powerful for me with design, the idea of creating a memorial of some sort. And uh, so I think I haven't put my finger on which memorial maybe, but something that, uh, yeah, I guess I've suffered loss like we all have. And I think yeah. the, the idea of connecting with design to leave a sort of legacy for someone else is interesting to me. How do you design a good memorial? I think something that's uh, as human as possible. <laughs> Yeah. That's interesting. Oh, all right. It is the year 2100, and people are talking about you. OK. That's what would you like to be remembered for? <laughs> that might not be a good one. 2100. OK. I think, what would I like to be remembered for? Um, that's a great question. My first just intuitive response is, uh, having two great kids that are still alive and uh, contributing to the world in a really positive way. So not so much my design, it's more around feeling as though I've delivered as a good parent. <laughs> so That's good, that's being, solid. Being truthful. How about yeah. yourself? Um, yeah, maybe a, a decent person. That yeah. would be a good start. Yeah. Uh, I have two kids too, so I think that's really important that um, you know, if we're talking people generally talking about me, I think made a difference would be, would be great. Do you know what I mean? Making positive change. I think that's what I'm trying to do a lot on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. in sort of my capacity as a designer. So uh, we're thinking a lot about the environment, I think is the biggest issue that we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. And sort of within product design, you know, what can we do? How can we change things for the better. So if I were to achieve that in my life and somebody made mention of it, that would make me very happy. Agreed. Assuming we have planned it in 2100. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I love it. No, it makes perfect sense. I'm aligned with you on that for sure. Okay, what makes you get out of your bed in the morning? And you can't say coffee. <clears throat> um, I think I have a way of getting busy. So there seems to be this urgency all the time. So I'm excited to get out of bed in the morning and kind of work on the tasks at hand yeah. and, and run to a studio and meet my collaborators and, and get going. Cool. And I don't give myself a lot of time either. So it's kind of a autopilot, like 30 minutes from waking up to getting out the door. Yeah. It's kind of where I'm at. Very cool. <laughs> very, very cool. And, and yourself? Do you have a routine? Yeah, I think it's... 
I sort of wake up and uh, have sort of processed what, I guess it's sort of like a download of the night, right? And uh, so I, I intend to wake up with clarity and I want to action on that clarity. So maybe it's a very similar feeling. Um, and desire to explore, you know, I'm like really f fresh to see something new and experience something new. So that's um, very much motivation for me to get out of bed and uh, sort of get out there and, and see how I respond to it before the day somehow takes over, if you know what I mean. Yeah? Yeah. I'll grab one. Let me see. If we asked your first boss to describe you, what would she or he say? So first boss, so maybe I was 12 years old, I'm not sure that's the boss. Um, first professional boss, what would you say? Um, that's a great question, actually. I have only had one boss when I really think back. And um, I think it's more, for me, I guess, I think they say something that it's the, the same today in some ways. And um, some of it's very curious. Um, I think same time serious but playful. And I think it came through in the work that we would do. And uh, I don't know, just so I'm really passionate about the type of work that I, that I do and uh, always looking to share the work that I do with, with others around us. So I think there's something community around the way I think about design. And uh, so I think they would remark about that because that's something that I felt strongly about then and I still do today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how about you? My first boss, I, I uh, graduated from design school in 2001 and um, it was not easy to, to get a job. People around 2011, no, 2001 with the whole 9-11 stuff were not terribly excited to talk about design and, and stuff like that. Sure. Um, and I started basically, I got a job at a branding agency as a, as a for some reason, I don't know, these guys were not maybe, and this is maybe bad judgment. So maybe what I'm saying is that my first boss had really bad judgment because right. I had broken my finger in a in a wakeboarding accident pretty okay. badly. And so I had like a cast on my basically mouse hand. Okay. So you would assume that you would be fairly useless yeah. as, a, okay. as a designer unless you were just describing things or, you know. Yeah. Um, no, and so anyways, I got a job at this branding firm and uh, um, and I was just very enthusiastic and I think maybe intolerable as a, as a person <laughs> you know, <laughs> about what we were doing and, and kind of, um, I think I was taking this stuff we were doing much more seriously in some respects than yeah. some others within the workplace. And, and I think maybe that's kind of similar to sometimes I feel like we care about the work we do for our clients sometimes even more than they do. Yeah, without doubt. Um, and maybe that's consistent still. I feel like that's, you're supposed to in some ways. At least I do, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, in some ways it's a terrible business because you always have to kind of yeah. over deliver and, you know, in a record time and, and, and all that jazz. But yeah. um, I don't know, what was your first job? I was working at a uh, product design studio on 23rd Street and uh, right out of college. I guess that would be my first job and I was there for two years or so. Yeah. And um, how things have changed. I was designing remote control caddies. So like things to hold remote controls. At the time you had like five <laughs> remote controls. I was designing spice racks, yeah. uh, barbecue tools, like the opposite of what I wanted to do for design. Like uh, design was poetic for me. It was storytelling. It was making meaningful work. And then welcome to your first job, like doing this sort of thing. Uh, I took gluing flower vases to computer screens, like this was the job. And yeah, it was interesting. That's when I really learned. It was a good experience because it told me this is not something I want to do. Yeah. And it caused me to leave New York, actually, and yeah. caused me to pursue furniture design. And, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Like for me, there's something I have thought about this a lot. I feel like we use products uh, oftentimes to show emotions or gratitude or that we have achieved something and mm -hmm. these vehicles that that are just not needed right and all these like knickknacks and little gift things and stuff like that is something that i i feel terrible about and also in in the context of yeah. sustainability and all this then it it really 
uh, I would say it aggravates me, but almost, yeah, you know, it, it, it it's uh, terrible. And I think what you're describing, these products that, that you know, are questionable products that should not necessarily exist, sure. you know, and, and don't have much value as products. Um, I started designing, for instance, POP, which means, yeah. you know, point of purchase, like these displays and stuff like that. And what I think is so interesting about it, that nobody desires that. Nobody wants like a POP yeah. in their life. <laughs> yeah. and, and so how do you make somebody, yeah. you know, take notice of that or find interest in it or want to talk to somebody about it okay. is extremely difficult, almost impossible. Uh, so maybe some of these experiences kind of help you be better, I think, in some ways by realizing Absolutely. some things about that. I don't know if there is some... Is there a worst assignment that, that, that you've had? No, I meant to just steer clear. That was probably the worst. Um, yeah, no, thankfully. Um, I haven't had to work for the tobacco business yet, so thankfully I have no plan on it. So. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll jump into one here for you. Okay, this is cool. Describe the aesthetics in your home country. Good question. Yeah. Um, so the country itself, without sort of the man-made component of it, is pretty raw and still varied mm. and ever-changing. And I think it's really interesting as you drive through Iceland every couple of hours or an hour, there may be a completely different landscape and mm. changes and, and so on. And there is sort of this rawness to it because part of it is very new with all this lava and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and there, it's simple, it's not lush, it's, it's kind of uh, fairly angular and kind of to a degree minimal in some ways. So like you could drive through Sweden and you're just like in this forest tunnel most right. of the time. Um, and I think sometimes there are things that are closer up where in Iceland I feel like you're always looking into the distance to a degree. There's a joke that it says basically if you get lost in an Icelandic forest, stand up right. because there, there are no tall trees. You know? right. um, but then I think in, in terms of how people live, I think uh, even though Iceland is not you know, one of these design powerhouse nations, um, I think we benefit from kind of that Nordic design heritage, mm -hmm. I think from Denmark, Finland, Sweden. Um, and I grew up around a lot of these products and I didn't even know it until later on that I was, it was pointed out to me or I learned more about design history. Um, so I think we share or benefit from that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's interesting when you look at designers and what comes out of design schools depending on where they're located in the world or even within countries. Um, you see in the work, I think, people's reference or what their frame of reference is or what the environment is that they grew up in. And I think even if you want to go about designing sort of in a fairly agnostic way, I think you, that comes into your work whether you like it or whether you're aware of it or not. And I think that exposure is important. Um, yeah. Cool. Interesting. And you grew up in New York. Yes. And how has that influenced? Uh, it's interesting because even as you're describing Iceland, like I, um, I get it. You know, I get your point of view of it, and I also, have, fortunately, haven't been there, but I, I do understand. I can see Denmark immediately. I understand exactly their DNA. I can see France and understand their DNA. Italy, countries other than I can see their DNA and I understand it perfectly. And then I look back to the U.S. It's not so clear for yeah. me, and I don't know if it's because we're just such a mix of cultures, and I really don't know. Um, but I know myself having been sort of born into this furniture world for 20 years um, is very, very different than what I call American design. And as an American designer living overseas, designing furniture, uh, it's sort of alien in a way. And um, there's I think it's clunky here. I don't think it's very elegant. I don't think there's real understanding of how furniture is built here. And mm -hmm. um, 
nor does anyone care because they don't really live with it. You know, it's uh, it's not one of the metrics for success of having nice furniture. You know, so like there's a culture that just isn't here. Um, at the same time, you know, you look at the the design quality of like Apple computer or IBM or you know you can take Coca Cola for that or Nike and the the design is like on an extremely high level and much higher than anywhere in the world. And so on one hand, the sort of furniture world, which is you know, the culture that I come from and it feels totally disconnected to what I love and what I see in the rest of the world. But then the technology world, it's much more advanced than, so it's this kind of strange mix and it just sort of tells you where the interests lie in this country. But, um, and it's not around sort of being human in some ways. It's mm -hmm. not around sitting together. It's not around being with your family. It's not at all. And I think that's kind of odd. At least it, it's very generally speaking, of course, you can go to different parts of the country and get different experiences. but. But the furniture aspect, since we're both furniture folks, I think is very, very odd here, you know, and... Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's interesting. People make the mistake, I think, often to look at America as one market, where yeah. it's, in fact it's, it's all these complex. little yeah. countries almost that, that have their own uh, even way of seeing things or how you uh, assign value to things, which yeah. I think here has been traditionally more kind of bigger, better. And, and I think yeah. in the traditional American furniture aesthetic, you can get the cheapest thing and the most expensive thing and at a glance it'll look exactly the same. Yeah. You know, sure. and, and sort of in that uh, tradition. I I think that at the same time and for the I came here in ninety eight and I think that the sort of design IQ in America has skyrocketed mm -hmm. in the time that I've been here. And I think especially with yep. social media yep. and I think that um, the way of sort of how you buy things and how you evaluate their uh, yep. meaning, I, th I think, is is definitely in, in some sort of transition that I think is very positive. And I think maybe it's just because people have been burnt. I think you can buy some things here. I, I feel like, like say, a lawnmower, you can drive around on your lawn. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it's like super cheap. Yep. But at the end of the day, it's probably not going to last more than a year or two. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Until yeah. it falls apart. And I think people are catching on to this. I mean, um, I mean, to your point, I mean, you've got, ironically, you have, you know, take Arnie Yachts and take a Scandinavian uh, Dean, right? And um, it's like the first one that comes to my mind. And and you can take, uh, you know, Castiglione from Italy. You can take, uh, it would take someone contemporary, take Massad from France. Like there's a sort of, there's sort of designers that are representative of the culture and they're somehow mm -hmm. part of the lineage, you know, and then in the US, you know, we had Eames, we have Nelson, we had these somehow, these greats, at the same, Massad, of course, being contemporary, but take the sort of legacy design, there's inequality there, but then somehow it didn't continue. And that's something that I found interesting, that it somehow, you know, what Herman Miller Group historically had done, even Florence Knoll had done, and then it hadn't really continued on. And, uh, yeah. and, and that's odd to me. And I, Whereas it's become an identifier, it's become an industry, it's become, you know, I was going to design school, there was no furniture design, there was no interest in it, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And um, now there's, you know, a thousand design schools all over the U.S. and talking about furniture. And so something's definitely shifted and mm -hmm. it's, it's emerging. And um, the challenge is we don't have the manufacturing necessarily or the craft that has to get re-understood. Re mm -hmm. um, it's not a continued, take the Italians, for example, it's not... It is a known craft that's continued through generations, and that's not something that's here. And even factories, as you probably know, working with here, don't have the know-how. And uh, so there's that barrier as well. So it's just arrived to create some some challenges. I, I don't know I sound quite critical, maybe because I am, <laughs> but but I think at the end of the day, uh, it's up to designers like us to help guide that forward. So Yeah, I think there has been sort of a renewed interest in craft, and maybe there's a... Uh, bridge that needs to be built from people say in Brooklyn that are making handmade mm -hmm. furniture that is of great quality and they've studied themselves and maybe more individuals or small teams that are making something very much you know that is for their own aesthetic and and their basically immediate community let's say yep. whereas that doesn't necessarily translate into larger corporations that are you know manufacturing on a greater scale right and I think we've seen sort of these these uh, transitions in in uh, how people appreciate things and how tastes evolve. Even like if you think about like through coffee or 
fixed gear bicycles or like these things that are sort of indicators of this want for something right. with a deeper meaning or greater quality or right. or they sort of having moments of joy through products ultimately. And so I think these are all positive and I, I think that uh, maybe there's sort of this generation generational shift, you know, happening through that or... I mean, I, I hope so, but when you think back to the European industry, it's um, they tend to be privately held. They tend to be owners that mm -hmm. have this business, and their father had the business, etc. And they're continuing it. And there's some questions on: Is their younger generation going to be able to maintain it? And you're seeing some businesses aren't doing so well, and some are. So, but there's a family heritage. Here, it's not that way. As you know, you sit in a room for ten, ten decision makers. They're not mm -hmm. furniture designers. They're not interested in the craft of furniture. They're you know, MBAs that are mitigating risk and they're looking to see if they can turn revenue on it. And so the metrics to evaluate if it's a good design don't come from a place of passion and it's a decision by democracy tends to be. And, uh, or not democracy, right, or imperialist, depends on who's there, but somehow prefer the dictatorship of the European businesses. It's mm -hmm. a single owner, they have a vision and a passion and an understanding, and you align with them and you go, here it's not that simple. Someone sold washing machines six months ago and now they're selling your furniture and they're there to guide you on what they need. And um, so, and until I think there's young individuals that are gener developing their own businesses, cultivating these new, and they probably are, hopefully there are, the new brands that are to challenge these, these incumbents, I think we're in for a bit of a long, a long haul unless there's leadership within these larger companies that do understand the true craft and, and beauty of furniture. Yeah, I think that what what's interesting um, sort of to be positive about this is that you see these uh, conglomerates, or so like even if you want to take the Andy Warhol quote, like everybody drinks the same Coca-Cola, yeah. that was very true at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas now you have infinite choices for a lot of products right. and there's sort of this Crazy. fragmentation everywhere. And I think <clears throat> We're speaking to sometimes smaller and smaller audiences and rather than trying to make a product that appeals to everybody, you could say that if you try that now that it's not going to appeal to anybody really because you're not really making a connection. Right. Um, and we're seeing these sort of challenger brands that have a stronger identity or a stronger idea about how they make things. They may not be toppling the giants or especially mm -hmm. not when it comes to yep. um, you know, office furniture. But at the same time, we're seeing these you know, ways of going about things breaking up that are actually uh, scary, I think, to the larger furniture companies. And mm -hmm. hence they've been buying up, say, companies like Muto and so on for, you know, incredible amount of money for a short period of time. Um, that is sort of proving your point that they have a hard time innovating themselves. Proving my point that there are people with ideas that are, yep. you know, coming up with new things that I think may not you know, satisfy either of us perfectly in, in the way they go about business or, you know, in some cases I would like there to be more integrity when it comes to sustainability and sourcing and, sure. um, and that kind of stuff. But it, I think that, you know, I would look at some of that positively that it's possible. It's not as if the, you know, big players are so deeply rooted that they can't be challenged because we That's see that, sure. you know, continuously. Agreed. And that these yeah. ways of working that you know, out of a meeting room with 10 people that nobody is passionate about furniture but goes by a spreadsheet is yeah. not going to yield a product that is going to have any lasting right. sort of resonance in a way. Right. Um, so in that way, I think that um, the evolution is probably headed in the right way. I agree. In that sense. Yeah. Uh, to be positive. No, I agree. <laughs> I, know, I think yeah. now is actually the perfect time to take that step. As, yeah. a, as a new business, because I think there is there is market awareness, there's appetite, and um, so I think there's never been a time, and while the mergers and acquisitions happening, I think there's a leaving space yeah. for a new opportunity, there's no doubt. No, and I, I thought it was interesting, like I was reading like a lot of the history of Herman Miller, for instance, at the infancy of the company, like mm -hmm. the company was making super elaborate, intricate kind of hand carved even these big armors and all this kind of stuff and and um it was really designers that came there with a vision and an idea uh -huh. you know that had very much to do with the m moment of the time that you know cleaning all this stuff is super time consuming making it is expensive you know tastes are changing <clears throat> and people have a different idea about life and i think there are there's a moment here today as well where we're sort of rethinking the way we live i think in many ways Definitely. and i think it's 
is a big opportunity to kind of take that momentum and, and do interesting things as, as a result. Agreed. I think it's your turn. Is it my turn? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> That's a pretty straightforward one. What are you currently working on? Okay. Um, <clears throat> boy. So, a couple of things. <laughs> There's, uh, I guess, two things I'm most excited about I can share. Um, one is where we've been working on a project for the last uh, almost six years now, five and a half years. Um, I realize it's easier to grow human beings than it is in fence chairs. And uh, so this one project we're launching in the summer is, and you've heard this a lot in the last six months, but I'm proud to believe, I believe this is the truth, the world's most sustainable chair, because uh, it's taken six years to develop the supply chain, uh, create a new material, uh, I've done everything possible to create what's called a net positive. If you haven't heard this mm -hmm. before, I'll let you, even if you have, I'll share with you what net positivity is, is the product is, takes, uh, it diverts any waste product. It also collects material from, uh, let's say from the ocean, plastic. And uh, we're also at the same time offsetting completely the carbon footprint and like every aspect of it and uh, with water, solar, I mean, every possible aspect is that the more chairs that are sold, the cleaner the environment actually gets. And uh, so it's completely offset. And it's not by planting trees or something like that. It's completely restructuring the supply chain and the material that's, are, that's um, entering the chair. Uh, there's no heavy metals in it. I mean, every possible aspect of the chair has been resolved. It's a task chair. So it is a workplace chair. And it's one of the major companies here. So we're excited by it. It's been a huge undertaking. And, uh, but it's not enough to just make it super sustainable. It's um, super democratic. We've done away with all the controls that these chairs tend to have and you just sit in it and, it and it just responds to you and you move and you don't have to adjust anything so we're really excited by that so cool um as you know workplace people are shifting furniture and it's no more dedicated seating and it's uh, so we're getting just rid of all the so issues people have with when they sit because it's not made for them so this chair is instantly tailored for when you sit so uh, it's been a huge undertaking really excited by that so that's one um and the other one that we're doing is we have a lot of our work is uh, science informed, so we are, there's an emerging epidemic, thankfully not a pandemic, but unfortunately an epidemic for children's eyes where they're losing vision. It's happening all over the world. 10% of kids globally are having a developing of myopia. Mm -hmm. And myopia is a poor formation of the eye. It's not fully mature. And that's due to the fact that all of our lighting today has been really value engineered, the LED. And the LED is limiting the amount, the, the healthy spectrum of light to the human eye. And kids are getting more indoor time, more screen time. You, you do the math. So they're not getting light exposure that they need from the sun. So we're developing a, a, a glasses collection, which is delivering light passively to the kids' eyes, which is really great. And one, uh, excuse me, nine out of ten of um, these kids will go blind in their lifetime. It's horrible and it's emerging. And right now in uh, China, it's, uh, it's, it is an epidemic now. They're having trouble uh, outfitting their air force with pilots because of their vision. So it's a huge concern. And um, so for us, we're really looking to contribute to help get solutions out there for kids that we know need it. Between the ages of 3 to 12, their eyes need to develop. So we're getting glasses out there that are going to help these kids. So that's really cool. We're excited by that. Uh, so things like this, we love bringing together science and technologies into helping solve the problems that we're working on. So those are two examples. And how about, how about you? What kind of things are you, are you up to? Uh, we're working mm -hmm. on some furniture projects. Um, we are working on some packaging that has to do with sustainability specifically and kind of trying to close the loop on how... Um, how you get materials basically back into circulation. I think the biggest challenge with designing sustainability or designing for sustainability or circular design is really kind of um, where it goes from manufacturers with people and how we capture it back, how do we motivate people to get materials back into yep. the circle for that matter and yeah, for, for sure. companies to take more responsibility with that, reevaluating their business plans. Yep. Um, and um, and really kind of broaden our scope sort of more kind of up the supply chain and into where things are delivered and how ultimately 
consumers yeah. come in contact with the product and what happens to them or the products afterwards and, and sort of the information that uh, we can convey or how, how can we motivate people to make better decisions. So oh. these are some of the things we've been working on. We're working on uh, sneakers, for instance, that I'm very excited about. That's cool. something new for me because it's funny when you wear something like clothing or shoes, somehow it becomes a part of you. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you sit in a chair, do you know what I mean? During the day, you have a like option of many chairs to sit in, and you don't have to identify with one of them. But you're mm -hmm. probably just wearing right. a pair of sneakers or a shoes during the day. So that was a uh, for me some learning and, and something that I really enjoyed. That's cool. Or in the process of, um, we're also doing a ton of stuff for the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about mostly sort of younger people that are kind of starting their journey of cooking and uh, maybe a healthier lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, maybe in smaller spaces, you know, and, and uh, how can we create products that sort of evolve a little bit more about how you live rather than dictating how you behave yep. a little bit. Cool. Um, and uh, thinking about, you know, like kitchen is like littered with silicone and plastic gadgets and all this and so we're really kind of trying to take a fairly hard line on, on trying to use these materials as sparingly as possible. A lot of them clearly have a function right. and, and uh, uh, but in my opinion are overused. And um, so these are some of the concepts. I think these are kind of a lot of the same themes that carry through but different avenues I think where you apply them. Yeah. Okay, here's a, here's a tough one. I think we all know the answer to this one. As a creative person, does it feel like you're always working? <laughs> <clears throat> you could look at it two ways. Either you're always working or you're always having a fantastic time. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I feel so uh, happy that I actually chose to do this. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm a prisoner in my own made prison in this sense. Do you know what I mean? That, yeah. that you, you're just doing this. And, but I wouldn't... Uh, traded for a different profession. Maybe Formula One driver for a few years. Do you know what I mean? But you know, apart from that, not <laughs> the ship sailed on that one. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. I feel the same. It's um the days that when it's when you're not having fun, those are the days you just need to take a take a walk and kind of take reset, you know? Because yeah. uh, there's no better way to learn about the world, about yourself, about each other than I think design. It's like such a great process to help help you engage things. So yeah, it's never, not really work. It's a, it's a beautiful way to, to learn. Yeah, it's funny. Like there was something memorable. Like my father, when I decided to pursue art school, introduced me to somebody that actually been working for him, doing some letterheads and stuff like this, this graphic designer, just to have a chat or whatever. And she told me like, what's going to happen to you is that your world is just going to change. You're just going to see everything very differently as a result. Mm -hmm. And I think about this often because it's so true. Yeah. And I think in product design and furniture, I think you get exposed to these different areas of life and you start all of a sudden focusing on that with a lot of in, intent and intensity. Um, and you learn just a lot about humans. I've been reading and listening to podcasts about more sort of psychology and all this kind of stuff, yeah. you know, and, and kind of a lot about human behavior and, and things that that I think in this career as it evolves like there are these different stages I think where you mm -hmm. find something new that is very interesting and may capture your attention for a while that may enrich your work at the yeah, end you know totally agree uh, um, tell us one mistake you have made and what you learned from it oh boy I feel like I get the hard question um, <laughs> One mistake, and what have I learned from it? I think, I don't know, I guess, again, my intuitive response to that is um, sometimes listening to our clients and um, trying to deliver really what they are asking for rather than what I see. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I know it's going to die, and I know it's not going to work, but they want it. And I kind of try to push back and try, and then you just can't, or couldn't figure them out, or you couldn't solve how to communicate it. And, but you give them what they want and they're happy, and then you just, you know, it's going to die. And I think 
yeah, I, I hate being in that position. And, uh, you know, there's good clients and there's bad clients, obviously, right? And, uh, but I think, you know, I try now that we've changed, we've evolved our process to really step, like take really tiny, tiny steps with our clients, like every step of the way, like we're just bringing them along instead of, it used to be, you know, okay, we'll see you and show up with this sort of concept and then from there disappear, show up with like the right. next stage. And that leaves room for them not really understanding a lot of what happened in there. All these millions of little decisions that you might have taken to help guide things. And so what we've learned is that, and that's caused this somehow, us delivering what they need or they want, let's say, mm -hmm. rather than what we think is best for them. And uh, whereas now we've shifted our process to be super granular and transparent the entire way and uh, showing good things, bad things, showing things we're just exploring and just being really open about it. And you start to see that um, they get into the process now and they start to understand like where you're trying to go. You might not have mm -hmm. the answers yet, but you're guiding and, and that's changed dramatically our engagements. And, uh, and you start to see that they're in it, they understand like what elbow grease you're putting in and how much you care to really get them somewhere. So they bought in now to actually getting to this maybe new destination that you might not, they might not have planned on at the beginning. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that clients come to you sometimes saying, I want this object or may sort of, right. because they saw something in the market or they think that there is an opportunity or, for or that. You, or, or you made something but like this. Exactly. Yeah. And rather than saying like, this is my objective, like this is what success means for me or whatever. And then right. we'll help you get there. Do you know what I mean? And right. I think, to your point, I think oftentimes we need to clarify what these objectives are before yes. we start and sort of push back on, on the brief as it sits. And if we do our job well, then everybody should be pleased. And generally, yep. that's the thing. Uh, I think my mistakes tend to be that there was a voice inside of me that told me I should do something and I didn't listen. Yeah. And you recognize afterwards that, you know, we, I knew this was going to happen, but I didn't right. recognize it, you know. That's right. uh, and uh, working with a hairdresser with an idea, terrible idea. Never do that. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. I have this idea for this gadget, you know, don't take that on. That's terrible. That's a dead end. <laughs> that's good advice. Did you choose your profession or did it choose you? I think I, so in the beginning, I didn't even know that this existed as a pr profession. Like in Iceland, there was no industry. There was art school. Art school was kind of artsy. Didn't really, you know, see me, me there somehow, but I, I knew that I wanted to make things and I didn't even care what it would be. Like I'm happy designing a vending machine or something. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and I thought at the beginning it was kind of like, well, maybe it's car design because that's very obvious because it's sort of acknowledged and I think as I started school which was definitely the right thing for me to do I just was exposed to all this potential that what you can do with this is just fairly broad yeah. you know because I'm, I'm you know still working in a number of different disciplines that are oftentimes you know whether it's consumer product packaging or furniture that are sort of looked at as different disciplines I've never really looked at it that way, mm -hmm. even though, you know. Uh, but I think it chose me. I, I don't know. I had to do this somehow. Yeah. How about yourself? I think something very similar. I, I was a, a drawer. I thought I would be a fine artist. That yeah. was my life. And then I went to uh, apply to design school and to get in here in New York. To get in, you had to make um, one was a sort of class, it was a very classical examination, of, but you had to submit drawings. And they basically gave you a brief and they said, uh, this is a scenario, you need to make a drawing about this thing. And it was about the scientific uh, situation in the world that you needed to solve and make a drawing for it. And, and I didn't know that this examination was more to somehow filter out your interests. So some of it was more leaning towards fine art, some more towards design. Oh, funny. And uh, so I said, I don't know what I just did, but that was fun. Like, that's what yeah. I really like. And, uh, and they said, well, that's called industrial design. I was like, well, what's that? So, so they sold it to me of just go in and you'll learn how to draw anyway. So if you don't like it, you can switch to fine arts. And, but I just immediately knew that's what I love. My love of science and art in the most fundamental form really came together. And um, so I never looked back. So, but as you as well, there was two schools at the time, maybe three in the US that focused on this and that didn't know anything about it. And, um, 
So when I came out, I just thought, wow, I don't know. There, that's why I, I never really even had that one job. And I just thought uh, it wasn't like a profession yet for being a furniture designer or someone in the space in the U.S. So yeah. that's why I just started working and for myself and, and left because there was not really an opportunity here. It's kind of interesting. So, yeah, I, I guess it found me in a way. The land of opportunities yeah. Yeah. does not offer an opportunity. I'm sure it was there. I'm sure it was there, you know, but I didn't, uh, there was no like mentors. There was no, like the school wasn't like, you want to do furniture design, you should explore. Like there was no yeah. advice for it, like it is now. It was go, you should be a product designer. That's what you've just learned to be. Yeah. And, and go make remote control caddies and like, you're going to do great. You got to pay your school loans now. So like, okay, the idea of the, the, the meter is running, so you got to go out and get a job. So all this like stuff sort of forces you down this path. Yeah, and then like in the middle of the night, you wake up, you think this is not what I wanted to do. You know, did you find um, people in other countries open to a designer from America, with an American N education? Not immediately, and then because I think there was, as I mentioned a little earlier, there's like a little a lack of cultural understanding. But then I had lived there for so long that I, I. I don't want to say I paid my views, but I visited the facilities. I got to know the landscape really well. Mm -hmm. So for me, they were very welcome and in some ways happy to have. That's when it was useful to not be Italian or to be French or not be Scandinavian because they already had a kind of person that was. Mm -hmm. They sort of ticked the box. But for, as an American, they didn't have anyone. So like Capellini and all these sort of, uh, you know, Zanata, B&B, all these brands didn't have an American at the time. So they were like, great, we finally can put a American in our profile, maybe sell in the U.S. Yeah, like that's, that yeah. was the advantage. And there was no other Americans really around, very few. So um, it was an advantage at that time. Yeah, it's interesting that it was, mm -hmm. weirdly, because design was looked down. Uh, they were very much looking down on American design. And um, that's why I, I would say, but what about Apple, you know? But And everyone said, well, yeah, but that's not the same thing. You yeah, know, they so don't I, make the, the right, link. Yeah, right. Yeah. How about you? Coming here, I mean, was it... Um, did anyone even care that you weren't quote unquote from here? Because that, you know, what does that even mean here? No, it's funny. When I came to New York first, I'd, I had lived in Paris for a couple of years and mm -hmm. I lived in a year in Copenhagen prior to that. And it was like a progression from like Reykjavik to right. Copenhagen to Paris. And then I was like, why not New York? That would be great. And right. so it was a bit of a, I'd been here as a teenager um, for a brief minute and then when I came here as a what 23 year old um, it was a bit of a shock actually I found the city kind of mm. messy and mm -hmm. not very pretty mm -hmm. maybe from an airplane but not on the ground do you know what I mean and, yep. and sort of some of this architectural ambiguity do you know what I mean like oh, yeah. why are you building buildings with columns like yeah. in the 70s or whatever yeah. like, that, that's confusing to me oh yeah um, no but then what you were saying like it was sort of this kind of multicultural thing here like one day I discovered do you know what I mean like this is a nice place to be mm -hmm. more sort of uh, meritocracy and yeah. you know you just work it out on your own merit and I thought um, being from Iceland here is such an unknown quantity yeah there is no like animosity towards <laughs> something from Iceland <laughs> unless you visited and had a bad experience and at that point not many had so true uh, so I thought, you know, it's a net, net positive at the end of the day, yeah. you know. Um, and I, th I think it's interesting whether New York represents America in the traditional sense right. because it's such a multicultural place. And I think right. the design industry, if you want to call it that, here is, has a ton of people from all over the place, you know. And traditionally, a lot of Europeans, obviously, and I think it's yep. everything's opening up more, which I think is great. I moved at I was 24 when I also moved overseas, and I it is an interesting time to be at that age to be here or to be in a new city. I think, and because um, you're not you know you're, you're old enough to be able to engage it, you know, but um, but you're not sort of set in ways yet. At least I wasn't. Yeah. So I think it's an interesting time to be. In a new city, and th this city itself is one of those that I have, you know, I had to sort of rediscover it when I came back, and uh, and it had changed quite a lot, and I had to like let go of how I knew it to be, you know. Yeah, it's and, interesting. And I think it's um, 
and in some ways I still haven't too. I don't know, maybe I'll never will, but I also feel like it has never been better as well. And uh, I mean, not to speak for the situation of COVID and all like what's happened, the city is hurting, uh, but I, I know the culture of the city. I think it's really beautiful what can be achieved here. And it really is your own limitation when you think about it. And I, I don't know of anywhere else where I feel like you can just really do anything here. Mm. And, uh, I don't feel that anywhere else. Yeah, there's sort of this energy. I don't know. It's yeah. hard to describe, you know. Because why the hell would you be here? I mean, yeah. is it the, <laughs> you yeah, know, the cost, the of, cost of housing? Or is it the transportation or the yeah. smell? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Thank you. It's a pleasure to have this conversation. Thank no, you. I really enjoyed it. It was <laughs> exceeded <laughs> expectations. How was that? <laughs> well, that's always good. Thank you. Not, no, that was not, that didn't come out right. It was terrible. Was it? <laughs> Thank you for joining us for this wonderfully uh, thought-provoking conversation between designers Lynn Ratlason and Todd Bratcher.